Welcome to Not Two Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. Chile, an attempt at historic compromise. The real story of the Allende years by Jorge Palacios. Chapter 5 The U.S. Policy Toward the Popular Unity Government 1. The Failure of the Alliance for Progress In order to understand the policy of the U.S. in regard to the Agenda government, it is essential to analyze both the changes which took place beginning in 1969 in the government and the policy of the United States, and the fate that the policy applied by the democratic administrations during the Frey government suffered in Chile. During the Kennedy administration, Chile was chosen as a pilot country to test the so-called Alliance for Progress policy. Two fundamental objectives were pursued through this policy. On the one hand, to contribute to the development of dependent capitalism, putting the most profitable sector of manufacturing industry under the control of U.S. investors. On the other hand, on the basis of this capitalist development subordinated to monopoly capital to enlarge the market for machinery, technology, raw materials, spare parts, etc. for certain sectors of U.S. industry. On the political level, it was a question of using the reforms necessary for this capitalist development some of which went against the interests of the landed oligarchy and of certain national monopolies, to develop a populist movement through intensive demagogic publicity. This movement would act as a break on any revolutionary opposition and on the exacerbation of nationalist anti-imperialist tendencies. The policy of the democratic group in the U.S. basically represented the interests of advanced industries like electronics, petrochemicals, precision machinery, etc., as well as the service industries and the big trading firms. These monopolies had an interest both in investing in a Latin American market expanded by regional treaties and, on the basis of capitalist development, in selling what they were producing in the U.S. For example, these groups were unhappy when the Import-Export Bank refused the Allende government a credit of $21 million it had asked for in order to buy three Boeing aircraft for the Chilean National Airline. The New York Times, a representative of these interests, published an article on September 2, 1971, which stated, quote, Unemployed aircraft workers in Seattle will scarcely be pleased to learn that the United States' move against Chile will increase employment in the Aleutian plants of the Soviet Union if Chile is forced to turn to the only alternative source of long-range commercial jet aircraft, end quote. The Washington Post, another paper characterized by its opposition to the coup d'etat in Chile and to the military junta, declared in this regard, quote, It is not only toward Chile that the United States is brandishing the stick, but toward the whole of Latin America and the entire world, end quote. Expressing these opinions, the president of the National Association of Manufacturers stated, quote, there can be no greater error than to believe that our export business depends on the economic retardation of other countries. Our main obstacle in the export business with Latin America is the people's lack of purchasing power. This market is growing not through an increase in raw material wealth, but through industrialization. History shows that when the people of any country develop their industry profitably, their consumption grows, creating a greater demand for foreign and domestic goods. The best consumers are not the countries producing mainly raw materials, but the industrially developed ones, quote. In 1943, a report published by the same association had already pointed out, quote, It must always be remembered that the economic value of trade between the United States and other countries increases in proportion to the development of the countries traded with. There is a widespread opinion that if the nations which formerly had little or no industrial activity were to develop extensive industry, they would, as a result, reduce the export market for American industries. However, this is not a necessary result. An abundance of statistics shows that, as industry develops, purchasing power also increases 
and with it the demand for imports. It therefore follows that efforts to raise the standard of living of the backward countries through intensive use of their resources are profitable for the United States. End quote. Albert Hirschman, a member of the governing board of the Federal Reserve System, stated, quote, Probably the most important reason for our lack of anxiety over industrialization abroad rests in the composition of our exports. Unlike a country such as the United Kingdom, our exports typically consist of items suited both to increasing production, machines, equipment, or other investments, and to high or growing income levels, automobiles, and other durable goods. That is why our exports not only are not threatened by industrialization abroad, but on the contrary benefit considerably from the expansion of production and the raising of incomes in other regions of the world. This is in marked contrast with what is happening in industrial countries whose exports are based mainly on items such as textiles, which are one of the first things to be produced by countries that industrialize. Furthermore, end quote, he added, quote, The United States exports substantial quantities of industrial raw materials, such as cotton, oil, etc., and these exports directly benefit from industrial expansion abroad, end quote. In any case, the Alliance for Progress policy also called for U.S. investments in the most profitable developing industries. Thus, profits were made in two ways from the process of industrialization in Latin America. By increasing the sale of capitalist goods and luxury products, as well as raw materials, and by directly appropriating the most lucrative part of this development. It is for the traditional monopolies, engaged in the extraction of raw materials in the dependent countries, that the industrial development of these countries is undesirable, for it brings with it both the demand for higher wages in the firms through which they exploit these resources, and a tendency to recover the resources in order to use them in developing the industry of the country. This is why these monopolies are generally opposed to a more liberal policy which would allow the workers to fight for higher incomes and to any capitalist development inside the dependent countries. This is why their favorite political allies are the big landlords and the national monopolies, forces which hold back capitalist development in opposing it and are prepared to make fewer concessions to the workers and to practice harsher repression. Having discovered that it was impossible to rely on the traditional parties of the oligarchic and monopolist right, due to their extremely retrogressive nature and opposition to all reform, the Kennedy administration began to seek the support of new, more dynamic class strata, and a different political force as the instrument of its plans. Thus, beginning in 1961, the year in which the U.S. government elaborated its formulation of the Alliance for Progress at the Conference of Chancellors in Punta del Este, Uruguay, the Kennedy administration explored the possibility of using the Radical Party or the Christian Democratic Party for its new policy. The following year, it had already decided in favor of the latter. In light of the facts known to all concerning the aid and loans granted to the Frey government by international credit organizations in which the U.S. had decisive influence, and of the secret facts, partly revealed in the U.S. Senate report on CIA involvement in Chile, it is clear that the CDP is virtually a creature of the CIA and of the U.S. government. This despite the fact that many of its supporters come from the ranks of the people. Deceived by multi-million dollar propaganda, they must have been the most surprised to learn the origin of the economic resources which their leaders spent to make the CDP the largest party in Chile, both in influence and in electoral strength. The support of the United States for the CDP, as we have pointed out, has two basic aspects the open economic aid given by U.S.-controlled credit organizations, and the secret support given by the CIA, and, through it, by the multinational corporations. As to the first aspect, suffice it to say that during the Frey government, the external debt rose to about $3.13 billion as of December 31, 1970. The director of the U.S. Economic Mission to Chile, Sidney Weintraub, was correct when he pointed out on October 2, 1969, that, quote, Chile represents approximately 3.5% of the population of Latin America, and in recent years, it has received about 12% of United States economic aid to Latin America. Obviously, Chile has received preferential treatment. Chile has received more aid per capita than practically any other country in the world, end quote. 
As to the secret aid of the CIA, which it admitted to before the U.S. Senate committee that investigated its involvement in Chile, the CDP benefited from projects promoted and financed by the CIA beginning in the 1950s. Projects aimed at the peasants, the slum dwellers, the organized workers, and the students. All this activity was later directed in favor of the CDP. However, direct aid began in 1962 with a CIA grant of an initial sum of $230,000 to establish the CDP, to use the CIA's own expression. It was in this way that in the municipal elections of April 1963, this party became the most influential in Chile, with 22.7% of the vote. Prior to this, the National Falange, the party which had given birth to the CDP and from which its first leaders had come, had obtained barely 3.9% of the vote in 1949, and had dropped to 2.8% in 1953. Later, $3 million were given to the CDP for the Frey presidential campaign in 1964. In addition, according to the Yankee Senate report, the CIA financed groups of pro-CDP students, women, professionals, slum dwellers, and peasants. This involvement, of which Mr. Frey, with supreme cynicism, claims to have been unaware, reached its peak, as the U.S. Senate report recognizes, with the formation in the U.S. Capitol of an election committee to give the campaign an American-style orientation. This committee included no less than the Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs, Thomas Mann, the head of the CIA Western Hemisphere Mission, Desmond Fitzgerald, and Ralph Dungan and McGeorge Bundy, representatives of the White House. A parallel committee, fully coordinated with the one formed in Washington, was organized in Chile with embassy representatives and the head of the local CIA station. However, to judge the magnitude of financial aid to the CDP, two aspects must be considered. First, that these were the contributions admitted to by the CIA, and second, that since they were secret contributions, these dollars were exchanged on the black market, where they are worth several times the official rate. Under the Allende government, the CIA admits having exchanged them at five times their official rate, but at certain periods the difference was much greater. Suffice it to say that in some months under this government, the minimum wage of a worker could be paid with one dollar sold on the black market. In regard to the amount of the aid, some journalists, like Bernard Collier of the New York Times, maintained that about one million dollars a month left the U.S. throughout most of the 1964 election campaign. As to the aid from the Christian Democratic Parties of Europe to Frey, Collier puts it at $20 million minimum. To all this, one must add the aid of $1.5 million offered to the Frey campaign by the representatives of multinational corporations having interests in Chile. This aid, as the CIA modestly admitted, was granted to the CDP on its advice through a businessman. As a result of this massive support, Frey obtained 56.09% of the vote in the 1964 presidential election, and the certainty of this victory allowed the U.S. Embassy and the CIA to reject, on the eve of the election, no less than three offers of coup d'etat that were made to them by various democratic and constitutionalist Chilean army circles in the event that Allende won. The secret CIA aid continued during the Frey administration in order to politically support his work in the service of U.S. policy. In 1965, the 303 Committee, precursor of the 40 Committee, which is in charge of the CIA, authorized the granting of $175,000 to support a group of candidates selected by the U.S. Embassy to run in the parliamentary elections at the end of March in the same year. In these elections, the CDP became the majority party in the Senate and gained an absolute majority of votes in the Chamber of Deputies. Thus, the conditions for the implementation of the so-called Alliance for Progress policy were nearly perfect. However, not satisfied with the direct support of the CDP, the CIA launched its own anti-communist propaganda campaign, before and after the presidential elections, and admits having spent an additional $2 million and 20 secret projects carried out between 1964 and 1970. These projects included organizing a popular movement amongst the slum dwellers and the peasants. For this purpose, three pro-CDP trade union federations were created during this period in the countryside. 
supporting an anti-communist women's group, encouraging opposition trends in the CUT, financing numerous posters and propaganda of all types, and, lastly, giving heavy financial support to the newspaper El Mercurio, whose editorials the CIA admits having inspired on a daily basis. Of course, all this spending was not done out of pure love of democracy, nor was it wasted. Frey had to pay back by promoting the profits of the U.S. monopolies and their penetration of the Chilean economy, and, in general, by implementing the reforms that the so-called Alliance for Progress policy advocated for Chile. Following the directives of this policy, Frey strengthened the state corporations with which U.S. investors wanted to associate in joint ventures. He implemented several partnerships of this type, making shameful concessions to the imperialist interests. He spurred agrarian reform, as well as the unionization of the peasantry and a minimum wage for peasants, in order to develop capitalism in the countryside, a reform demanded by the U.S. not to help the peasantry, but to expand the consumer market for the U.S.-backed industries. He improved the training of manpower for these industries through apprenticeship courses. He spurred fiscal reform to facilitate the financing of an entire infrastructure necessary to the development of dependent capitalism. Lastly, he promoted the entry of Chile into the Andes Pact and other regional continental agreements, a measure also demanded by the U.S. capitalists investing in industry in order to expand their sales market. Similarly, at the demand of his promoters, Frey tried to develop a populist movement designed to support the pro-Yankee reformism that he called Revolution in Freedom. This movement he developed particularly among the non-proletarian strata of the shantytown dwellers, housewives, peasants, students, etc. It was developed through activities that were inexpensive for the government, such as handicraft courses, production cooperatives, summer work for students, housewives associations, etc., and by means of an intensive demagogic propaganda campaign that presented the government's policy as revolutionary and anti-oligarchic, while praising the generous U.S. aid given through the Alliance for Progress. In addition, Frey acted in full accord with the wishes of the investors represented by the U.S. Democratic Administration, who were different from traditional investors interested only in grabbing raw materials, by throwing the doors wide open to the penetration of their capital in the most profitable industries. This plan to take over the manufacturing industry corresponded to an investment policy applied almost everywhere in Latin America, a policy served by the very reforms promoted by the so-called Alliance for Progress. According to the U.S. Department of Commerce publication Survey of Current Business, quote, U.S. private direct investment in the Latin American manufacturing sector increased from $1.52 billion in 1960 to $6.46 billion to $6.46 billion in 1973. For Chile, from the beginning of the Frey administration to the end of 1969, the investments totaled more than $320 million. Investments in manufacturing industry in relation to investment in other sectors of the economy, grew from about 3% in 1953 to 7.8% at the beginning of the Christian Democratic Administration, and later to about 14% in 1968. However, in the case of Chile, these figures do not give a clear picture of the Yankee efforts to take over the manufacturing industry, due to the already existing big investments in the copper mines. The investments in manufacturing industry grew faster than in all the other countries of the Andes Pact, rising from $22 million in 1960 to $68 million in 1969, that is, more than 300%. At the same time, the U.S. rapidly outstripped other countries in the relative importance of their investments in industry. U.S. capital rose from 59% of total foreign investments in 1964 to 75% in 1968. Frey paid back the generous U.S. aid for his candidacy and his government not only by facilitating the penetration of the Chilean economy and by faithfully applying the Alliance for Progress policy, but also by allowing the Yankee monopolies an unprecedented increase in their profits in Chile. During the Frey administration, their profits exceeded a billion dollars, and the average monthly profits were twice those recorded in the 32-year period previous to his administration – 
This means that during the Frey administration, the U.S. monopolies made declared profits almost equal to the total of their investments in Chile. Among the measures Frey took to facilitate the intensification of U.S. plunder of Chile's resources was the setting up of a few joint ventures under conditions shamefully favorable to foreign capital. Amongst these, let us give the example of the joint venture formed between the state and a few U.S. monopolies that exploited Chilean copper, a venture that Frey, with a certain black humor, called the Chileanization of copper. The Frey government Chileanized the El Teniente mine by buying 51% of the shares for $80 million. Kennecott, the owner of the mine, agreed to lend this sum to the newly formed joint company for 15 years at a 4.5% interest rate, payable in dollars and exempt from all taxation. Thus, Kennecott gained $35.5 million more. However, what was most monstrous about the deal was that the book value of the business in which the government was acquiring a 51% interest was only $65 million in 1963, and no further investments had been made in it. The mine installations were Kennecott's only contributions to the operation of Chileanization. Therefore, by paying $80 million for half the shares, 51%, the government was graciously crediting the U.S. monopoly with $160 million, when it had only invested $65 million. It was with reason that the U.S. publication Hansen's American Letter, written for investors in Latin America, stated, quote, It must be admitted that Frey has done so much for foreign investors in Chile, far surpassing their greatest hopes, that U.S. companies are starting to be as optimistic as former investors in Cuba used to be before Castro arrived on the scene, end quote. And the publication adds, quote, Chile is the Latin American republic most preferred by Washington, and it goes without saying, Frey is Washington's favorite customer, end quote. Further on, the same publication gives one of the reasons for its love for Frey when it states, quote, no government of the extreme right could have treated U.S. businesses with the generosity that Frey has shown in signing the agreements, referring to the agreements on the Chileanization of copper. The conditions, favorable to a fault, revealed such a lack of balance and judgment and were so contrary to Chile's interests that they provoked near hilarity in Washington, end quote. Because of its extreme servility towards U.S. imperialist interests, amongst other reasons, the Frey administration led the country into acute economic crisis in the final years of its term. This despite the enormous credits it had available, and despite an extremely favorable international price for copper on the world market, which had brought it an extra $200 million a year. There were other factors in this crisis. The fact that through incomplete agrarian reform, the Frey government was not successful in solving the crisis of the agrarian economy, but on the contrary, and militant peasant movement. The fact that it tied the country to an enormous external debt, which reached almost $3 billion in 1969, consuming just an in interest and amortization payments about half the total currency reserves. The fact that because of its pro-Yankee reforms and demagogic attitude, it lost the confidence of the national monopolist circles and of the capitalist circles influenced by the national monopolies. Thus, even though the Frey administration had very little effect on their interests, it could not count on them in applying its policy for investments in growth of production. As a result of these factors, amongst others, the average annual growth rate of industry, which had been about 7% for the first two years of the Frey government, dropped to a 2.3% average for the last four years. At the same time, industrial sales declined and the national product growth rate fell. The Consumer Price Index recorded an annual increase of 36% at the end of the Frey administration, and the unemployment rate exceeded 8% of the labor force. At the same time, the populist movement created at the prompting of the United States failed in its political objectives, that is, failed to hold back the development of class struggle. As the class struggle grew, the electoral influence of the CDP declined, despite the millions of dollars invested to promote it, to resist its opponents, and to promote the mass movements in support of it. From 42.3% of the vote it received in the 1965 parliamentary elections, the CDP dropped to 35.6% in the 1964 municipal councillors' elections, 
Later, in the 1969 parliamentary elections, it received only 29.7% of the vote. In regard to the mass struggles, despite the constant assistance that the CP trade union bureaucracy gave the Frey government to hold the struggles back, more than 2,000 conflicts took place in 1967, involving more than 2 million strike days. During the first eight months of 1968, this figure rose to 4.5 million strike days. In the countryside also, where strikes had been the exception in the past, five strikes in 1963 and only 39 in 1964, a powerful and militant movement was unleashed and the process of occupying land began. In the years 1966, 1967, and 1968, there were 1,688 peasant strikes, in which about 100,000 farm workers participated. In the three months from August to October 1969, there were more than 7,000 workers on legal strike in the countryside and more than 26,000 on illegal strike, according to the Labor Ministry data. The Christian Democratic government was forced to throw off its demagogic mask and use violent repression. Amongst the widely varied forms of repression were two massacres, one against the miners of the El Salvador copper mine, where, on March 11, 1966, eight people were assassinated by troops and more than 60 wounded, and the other involving eight deaths and 26 wounded against homeless people who had occupied vacant lands in the southern town of Puerto Montt. The temporary houses they had built were burnt with all their furniture. Finally, the economic crisis and the repression the CDP had unleashed, as well as its accelerating electoral decline, caused severe crisis within the party itself, as progressive trends appeared which challenged the government's policy. Thus, we see that the pilot test carried out in Chile for the Alliance for Progress policy an experiment that had its leaders dreaming of an era of at least 30 years of Christian democratic government had failed two years after it had begun, even inside the CDP. This fact is of prime importance to understand the change in U.S. government policy toward the popular unity, which would succeed the Frey government. The popular unity was no longer up against the reformist policy of the democratic administration, which, as we have said, was inspired by certain monopolies whose interests differed from those of the monopolies which had traditionally exploited Chile. It should not be forgotten that Kennedy, the man who inspired the Alliance for Progress, was assassinated precisely because of contradictions between monopolies. Once elected President of the United States, Nixon sent Nelson Rockefeller to Latin America to investigate the results of the Alliance for Progress policy. During his trip, Rockefeller was confronted by militant protests by the people of the countries he visited. After Rockefeller had written his report, President Nixon gave a speech indicating the general line of what would be his policy. The report of the U.S. Senate on CIA involvement in Chile points out in this regard, as early as 1969, President Nixon announced a new policy toward Latin America, labeled by him, Action for Progress. It was to replace the Alliance for Progress, which the president characterized as paternalistic and unrealistic. Instead, the United States was to seek, quote, mature partnership, end quote, with Latin American countries, emphasizing trade, not aid. The reformist trappings of the alliance were to be dropped. The United States announced itself prepared to deal with pragmatic foreign governments. In essence, this was a get-tough policy. The policy of penetrating manufacturing industry was maintained, but at the same time, the interests of the traditional monopolies operating in extractive industries were defended. The development of the people's struggles was met not with a pretense of reforms in populist programs, but with direct repression. To this end, Rockefeller recommended in his report that the armed forces be directly promoted into power when the bourgeois parties fail. Consequently, it was not by chance that Nixon's coming to power was followed by a series of coup d'etat in Latin America. The popular unity government took over when this process was already in full swing. The Allende government tried to win over, or at least to neutralize, the monopolist groups interested in investing in the manufacturing industry by concentrating its anti-imperialism on the mining monopolies operating in Chile as well as on the monopolies that controlled the public utilities, ITT. 
With a number of industrial firms, the government nationalized that part of the firm which represented Chilean investment and entered into a joint venture with U.S. investors, offering them very advantageous conditions. This was the case with companies engaged in automobile assembly in Chile and with electronics, metallurgical, petrochemical, and other firms. For example, in March 1971, an agreement was reached with the Radio Corporation of America, RCA, through the Production Development Corporation, Corfo. The government bought shares held by Chilean capitalists and formed a joint enterprise with the U.S. monopoly, which continued to control 49% of the shares. A similar agreement was concluded with the INSA tire manufacturing firm. Also in March 1971, an agreement was reached with U.S. capitalists to form a joint enterprise in mining and steel called the Pacific Steel Company. The state would control 35.7% of the shares of this company, Armco Steel Corporation 34.3%, and the electro-metallurgical company, Rockefeller Group Capital, 30%. In addition, in the chemical industry, the investments of the U.S. Dow chemical monopoly were maintained. These measures were not isolated, but corresponded to a clearly defined policy of the UP government. The finance minister, Amerigo Zorilla, a member of the Secretariat of the Central Committee of the CEP, stated in a speech to a meeting of governors of the Inter-American Development Bank on May 11, 1971, quote, In the framework of the Chilean revolutionary process, both external financing and foreign capital investment must play a role. Oriented toward priority goals, responding to economic necessities, and complementing our own internal effort, Foreign investment will be the source of a dynamism greater than that which it has traditionally given rise to, end quote. And he added, quote, For these foreign investments, the vast field of the mixed and private sectors is open, on condition that the state give its approval by guaranteeing both its legitimate interest and a prospective orientation favorable to the development of the country, end quote. The offer of such investments to the Americans was one of the inducements that the USSR offered the U.S., with a view to joint domination of the Chilean people. For his part, Chancellor Clodomiro Almeida had pointed out to U.S. Secretary of State William Rogers in April 1971, quote, that it was not correct that the Chilean government opposed foreign investment. Only the basic resources, end quote, he maintained, quote, must remain in the hands of the state, but there are other economic categories and sectors in which foreign investments are perfectly possible, end quote. As an example, he mentioned the agreement with the Radio Corporation of America. 2. Nixon and Kissinger intervene in favor of a coup d'etat. The policy of the U.S. government toward the Agenda government did not fit into the framework of the reformist and semi-liberal trend that the Kennedy administration followed in Chile. In accordance with the recommendations made by Rockefeller in his report on Latin America, it was characterized by a hard-line attitude in suppression of the reforms. The need to establish the difference between these two policies neatly explains the mystery that a group in the U.S. Senate decided to investigate the CIA and expose its involvement in Chile. This group carried out the desire of a group of Democratic senators led by Church, a former candidate for the presidency of the United States, to establish the difference between the two policies for electoral purposes. Although it certainly hid many aspects of the activities of the CIA and was completely silent about the participation of the Pentagon through the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, the Senate committee was concerned to show that U.S. involvement under Kennedy and Johnson was different from the involvement that Nixon carried on. The Kennedy-Johnson involvement was described as preventative, ensuring Frey's victory and subsequent support for his administration, and at the same time reformist, that is, designed to alienate the people from communism rather than to repress it. In the words of the Church Commission, quote, Arguably, the 1964 election project was part of a progressive approach to Chile. The project was justified, if perhaps not actually sustained, by the desire to elect democratic reformers, end quote. In the case of Nixon and Kissinger, as the Senate report clearly establishes, involvement was aimed exclusively at overthrowing the Allende government. Although the former appraisal certainly does not characterize the general attitude of the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, 
which intensified the war against Vietnam and Laos, tried to invade Cuba, and intervened in the Dominican Republic, it basically corresponds to the policy applied during the Frey government in Chile. It is also true that the Nixon government, after the election of Allende, did its utmost to overthrow him, although for the sake of form, it maintained a hypocritically tolerant attitude toward him. Various factors entered into play in this get-tough approach of the U.S. government. In the first place, the fact that the Republicans represent, to a greater extent than the Democrats, monopolies that are linked to raw material extraction and to the exploitation of public utilities, ITT for example, monopolies whose aggressiveness, opposition to capitalist development in other countries, and alliance with the most repressive elements in the dependent countries are well known. In addition, one must consider the fact that the reformist policy and populism with which the U.S. imperialists and their agents tried to hold back the class struggle during the Frey administration had failed. Finally, one must take account of the fact that the U.P. government came to power at a difficult time for the U.S. economy. On top of their mounting setbacks in Vietnam and Cambodia, which would later force the U.S. imperialists to withdraw and defeat from these countries, came the start of a serious economic crisis, which would eventually engulf the entire capitalist world. As a study appearing in the January 1973 issue of the Latin America Empire Report, published by NACLA, North American Congress of Latin America, pointed out, quote, 1970 marked the culmination of the difficult situation that the American economy had already been going through for some time. Inflation was becoming uncontrollable, the unemployment index reached high figures, gold reserves were steadily dwindling, the U.S. share in world trade was down, and for the first time in nearly a hundred years, the trade balance was running a deficit. While this was happening to the U.S. economy, the countries of Western Europe and Japan appeared as examples of prosperity in full bloom. High rates of industrial growth, a growing share of international trade, increasing investment abroad, etc., the aggressiveness of European and Japanese competition must have heightened U.S. sensitivity towards the program of the UP in Chile, which included the nationalization of substantial American interests, end quote. The same study adds, quote, the, the new economic policy established by the Nixon government to confront the poor economic situation implied the need to exercise greater pressure on foreign governments, particularly in the underdeveloped world, so as to ensure the interests of U.S. investments, which, more than ever, were confronted with the need to strengthen their position in the face of the expansion of European and Japanese capital, end quote. Although it is certain that the efforts of the U.S. government to overthrow Allende came in the context of the serious economic crisis in the U.S., and that the crisis influenced the U.S. aggressiveness, particularly in regard to the blockade against Chile, the basic motivation of the U.S. government in overthrowing him was eminently political. The pace of the economic aggression was set by the Treasury Department, led by the ultra-conservative Democrat John Connolly, who had links with a number of multinational firms with interests in Chile. Connolly told Business Week in July 1971 that the United States could take a hardline approach toward Latin America in economic and trading matters, because, quote, we haven't any friends there anyway, end quote. The reaction, which we shall call economic, of reprisals against the Agenda program inspired violent editorials in newspapers linked to the affected interests. The News Washington Daily of August 13, 1971 said, quote, If we allow the Marxist Agenda to nationalize without compensation, this will create a precedent endangering the billions of American dollars invested in the mines, oil fields, and industries of Latin America. Furthermore, since these assets are insured by government agencies, it will be the American taxpayer who will pay for the damage, end quote. This was certainly true, at least insofar as the big copper mining firms in ITT were concerned, and it helped the affected firms to commit the U.S. government, if not the taxpayers, to opposition to Allende. The investments of these firms in Chile were protected by insurance policies with the United States government agency called OPIC, Overseas Private Investment Corporation, a branch of the AID. This agency had to indemnify Kennecott, Anaconda Copper, and ITT in the amount of more than $400 million, because they had been expropriated without what they considered fair compensation, 
this sum exceeded the financial capacity of the agency, and the government had to take charge of the debt. However, despite the opinions of many journalists who let themselves be taken in, or want to be taken in, by what was most ostensible, the blocking of certain credits for Chile, the most destructive blows against the Allende government came from the internal, secret work of the CIA and the Pentagon, aimed at dislocating the Chilean economy, at coordinating and strengthening the opposition to the Allende government, and at preparing the coup d'etat together with the armed forces. In this sense, it must be said that the most merciless attack against the Allende government came directly from the U.S. government, which pretended to be tolerant and neutral. This attack hit the Achilles heel of the UP, its lack of control of power, which prevented it from firmly stopping subversive opposition and from strengthening the economy in the transition to state capitalism, which prevented it from holding back the destabilizing factors that would facilitate the military coup d'etat. It is easy to understand that those who, like the CP leaders, contributed decisively to its overthrow with their wrong strategy for the winning of power and by their sabotage against the consolidation of the UP government, carried out with a view to their planned alliance with the CDP, have an interest in attributing its failure to supposedly invincible external factors, such as the blockade. However, internal economic and political stability, based on firm control of power by the people, would have well allowed these external factors to be overcome. Obviously, this was incompatible with the plans of the phony communists. The blockade was effective and caused serious damage to the Chilean economy, because the UP was unable to consolidate the economy, basically because it did not control power and was at the mercy of those who did hold it. On the other hand, the work of the CIA and the Pentagon, although it was the embodiment of external aggression, was effective because it hit directly at, the most decisive, internal contradictions that the Allende government faced. The decision of the U.S. government not to stop at forcing the Chilean government to pay compensation or causing problems for it in trade or international credit, but to directly overthrow it, was a decision based mainly on political reasons. It was a political decision, fundamentally aimed at preventing, quote, socialism, of the style of the Eastern European countries dependent on the USSR from being consolidated in Chile, and, more concretely, at blocking the first step towards such a model, a step set forth by the Soviet rulers consisting of an alliance of the CDP with a conglomerate such as the UP in which the pro-Soviet CP would play a dominant role. Awareness of this danger and of the necessity to avoid it at all costs prevented the U.S. government from applying a strategy of wearing down and discrediting the UP without resorting to a coup d'etat, a strategy which was also perfectly feasible and even more logical, given the excellent results achieved thanks to it. This process would certainly have led to the possibility of overthrowing the UP in the presidential elections of 1976 in the same way it had attained power. And let it not be said that the Chilean extreme right circles were capable of bringing a coup d'etat by themselves, and that the U.S. had to accept a fait accompli. Because of its influence in the decisive leading circles of the CDP, as well as in the army, and because of the resistance to the Putsch's solution by the group opposed to Frey within the CDP, the U.S. government could largely prevent the carrying out of a coup d'etat. The fact that the decision to intervene in Chile to overthrow the Allende government in the shortest possible time was eminently political and moreover was based on strategic considerations of international politics emerges from the intelligence reports on Chile sent by the CIA and other departments to the U.S. government during the UP administration. There is an apparent paradox in these reports. The more reassuring they were for the U.S. government, because they recorded the economic and political failure of the attempts to consolidate Soviet-style socialism, the more the efforts to push forward the coup d'etat were intensified at the insistence of the U.S. government. Obviously, as we shall see later, the fear was no longer that the UP experiment would succeed as a political example, nor was it of the alleged intentions of the USSR and the Comic-Con countries to support the UP at all costs. Rather, the fear was of the possible solutions to which the Allende government and the UP leadership might resort, precisely because of their failure to hold on to government. That is, 
the U.S. government feared the alliance with the CDP. In July 1970, one of the most alarmist of the NIEs was sent. It pointed out that an agenda victory would mean the gradual establishment of a classical Marxist-Leninist regime in Chile. It would be a Chilean version of a Soviet-style Eastern European state. However, it predicated that democracy would probably survive in Chile for two or three years to come, and that Allende would have a long way to go to lead Chile to Marxist socialism during the six years of his administration. To do this, he would have to surmount some very important obstacles, such as Chile's security forces, the Christian Democratic Party, some elements of organized labor, the Congress, and the Catholic Church. Lastly, it states that Allende expected progress on basic bread and butter issues, which would afford him an opportunity to secure control of the Congress in the 1973 election, and thereby enable him to impose a socialist state of the Marxist variety by the peaceful road. An NIE sent later, one month before Allende's electoral victory, stated that if Allende were to win the election, he would almost certainly take measures against U.S. business interests in Chile and challenge U.S. policies in the hemisphere. The NIE predicted, however, that Allende would probably not seek a break with the U.S. over the next two years. Finally, still in 1970, there was issued what the Senate report on CIA intervention in Chile calls, quote, the most direct report concerning the threat an Allende regime would pose to the United States, end quote. This report was issued September 7, and was sent not only to the CIA, but also to a group called the Interdepartmental Group for Inter-American Affairs, made up of representatives of the CIA, the State Department, the Defense Department, and the White House. The report concluded that the United States had no vital interests in Chile. The world military balance of power would not be significantly altered by an Allende regime, and an Allende victory in Chile would not pose any likely threat to the peace of the region. The report noted, however, that an Allende victory, quote, would be extremely costly on the political and psychological levels, end quote. The political cohesion of the hemisphere would be threatened by the challenge that the Allende government would represent for the OAS. Quote, chain reactions are bound to occur in other countries. An Allende victory, end quote, the report concluded, quote, would represent a psychological setback to the U.S., as well as a definite advance for the Marxist idea, end quote. As can be seen, the major preoccupying factors were eminently political, and it was these factors which motivated the preemptory and urgent order issued after Allende's election to overthrow him by a coup d'etat. Once Allende was installed in office, the reports became visibly more optimistic for the U.S. However, the offensive against the Chilean government was waged still more strongly. An NIE written in August 1971, after nine months of Allende government, stated that the domination of Marxist politics in Chile was not inevitable, and that Allende had a long way to go to achieve this. It also said that Allende would probably be impelled to use political techniques of increasingly dubious legality to maintain his coalition in power, even though he would certainly prefer to adhere to constitutional means. Up to that point, the NIE pointed out, Allende had scrupulously observed constitutional forms and was enjoying great popularity in Chile. An NIE written after 10 months of Allende government stated that relations between the U.S. and Chile were dominated by the problems of nationalization, although Allende himself seemed to wish to avoid a confrontation. A report prepared shortly before Allende's victory had indicated that Chile had long been a relatively open country for leftists, and would become even more so under Allende. Despite this, the report notes that Allende would be cautious in providing assistance to extremists for fear of provoking a military reaction in his own country. However, the same report observed that the degree to which revolutionary groups would be allowed to use Chile as a base of operations would be limited by the Orthodox Communist Party, which opposed violent groups. A report on the same subject, prepared in June 1971, stated that, contrary to some earlier indications that Allende might provide clandestine assistance to neighboring insurgency movements, evidence to date suggested that he had been sensitive to the concern of neighboring governments, 
and had sought to avoid action which would strain bilateral relations. Chile had warned Argentine and Mexican exiles that they could reside in Chile only if they did not engage in political activities. And some of the more politically active Brazilian political exiles had been invited to leave the country. The report predicted in conclusion that it was unlikely Allende would financially support or train exiles to facilitate the export of insurgency. An NIE issued in June 1972 stated that the future prospects for democracy in Chile seemed to be better than at any time since the start of the Allende government. It observed that the traditional political system in Chile continued to demonstrate remarkable resiliency. Legislative, student, and trade union elections continued to take place in normal fashion, with pro-government forces accepting the results when they were adverse. The NIE pointed out that the CDP and the National Party had used their combined control of both houses of Congress to stall government initiatives and to pass legislation designed to curtail Allende's powers. In addition, the opposition press had been able to resist government intimidation and persisted in denouncing the government. The report concluded that, quote, The most likely course of events in Chile for the next year or so would be moves by Allende towards slowing the pace of his revolution in order to accommodate the opposition and to preserve the gains he had already made, end quote. It should be pointed out that it was from this very moment that the CIA increased its contributions to organizations, which, a few months later, would promote the first big offensive to overthrow the government, the strike of October 1972. On the 29th of that month came the failure of the first attempt at talks between the CDP and the government to reach an agreement. And within the UP, faced with this initial failure to reach agreement with the CDP, Orlando Milla's line of retreat, designed to open the way to this agreement, was imposed. Another 1972 report noted that Allende, to date, had sought to avoid irreparable damage in his relations with Washington. And the report points out that although the major problem concerning U.S.-Chilean relations continued to be that of compensation for the nationalization of U.S. companies, Allende had taken pains to stress publicly his desire for amicable relations. In addition, a report the following year stated that Allende had kept lines open to Washington on possible Chilean compensation for the expropriation of U.S. copper companies. Finally, one last NIE sent in September 1973, just before the overthrow of Allende, demonstrated in its conclusion the central preoccupation of the U.S. government. The NIE focused on the probability of the Allende regime maintaining power. It concluded that at that juncture, the most likely course of events in Chile seemed to be a political standoff. It noted that Allende had not consolidated the power of his Marxist regime that the bulk of low-income Chileans believed that he had improved their conditions and represented their interests, and the growth and support for his coalition reflected his political ability as well as the popularity of his measures. The NIE noted, however, quote, that the growing polarization of the Chilean society was wearing away the Chilean predilection for political compromise, end quote. Nevertheless, the analysts predicted that there was only an outside chance that the military would move to force Allende from office. As can be seen, the trend of the intelligence reports is evidently more and more reassuring for the U.S. government. The USSR is maintaining a cautious position and is not trying to support the Allende government at all. The government, for its part, is avoiding interference in neighboring countries and is not helping subversive movements there. The bourgeois institutions are continuing to function, the government is running into obstacles in the application of its model of socialism. Moreover, the U.S. has no vital interest in Chile and the world military balance of forces has not been significantly changed by the UP victory. What is more, the last reports observe that the UP sees the possibility of setting up its state capitalist model receding. And since CIA activity was a decisive factor in its aggravation, the U.S. government must certainly have been well aware of the very serious economic crisis which was afflicting the country since 1972. Why not hope, then, that the intensification of the crisis would lead to the thorough discrediting of the government, so as to overthrow it in the 1976 elections? Why did the CIA seek untiringly and urgently to organize a coup d'etat, 
until it finally succeeded in unleashing one. The authors of the Senate report on CIA activity in Chile asked themselves these questions. In fact, they note that, quote, At the same time as the Chile NIEs were becoming less shrill, the 40 Committee authorized greater amounts of money for covert operations in Chile. The amounts authorized by the 40 Committee rose from $1.5 million in 1970 to $3.6 million in 1971, $2.5 million in 1972, and, during the first eight months of 1973, $1.2 million. Covert action decisions, end quote, they comment, quote, were not entirely consistent with intelligence estimates, end quote. At another point, they state, quote, a review of the intelligence judgments on Chile offered by U.S. analysts during the critical period from 1970 to 1973 has not established whether these judgments were taken into account when U.S. policymakers formulated and approved U.S. covert operations. This examination of the relevant intelligence estimates and memoranda has established that the judgments of the analysts suggested caution and restraint while the political imperatives demanded action, unquote. In fact, the Senate report points out, quote, The reaction in Washington to Allende's victory was immediate. The 40 Committee met on September 8 and 14 to discuss what action should be taken prior to the October 24 congressional vote, which would ratify Allende's election. On September 15, President Nixon informed CIA Director Richard Helms that an Allende regime in Chile would not be acceptable to the United States, and instructed the CIA to play a direct role in organizing a military coup d'etat in Chile to prevent Allende's accession to the presidency, end quote. According to the Senate report, the 40 Committee met, quote, on 23 separate occasions between March 1970 and October 1973 to authorize funds for covert activities in Chile. During this period, the Committee authorized a total of $8.8 million for CIA covert activities in Chile, end quote. On September 15, 1970, Nixon, Kissinger, and Richard Helms, director of the CIA, participated in a meeting at the White House to deal with the case of Chile. According to Helms' handwritten notes, President Nixon stated, quote, One chance in ten, maybe, but Chile must be saved. There is no getting concerned over the cost of the operation. There is no taking into account the risks stemming from it. One hundred million dollars available, and more if necessary. Work full-time with the best men available. Work out a plan with solutions. Make the Chilean economy scream. 48 hours to come up with a strategy, end quote. In his statements to the U.S. Senate Committee, Richard Helms declared that he left his meeting with, quote, the impression that the president had made it very clear that he wanted us to do something. He didn't much care how, and he was ready to provide all necessary funds. It was an order that left us carte blanche, so much so that if I ever had full power to act on leaving the president's office, it was on that day, end quote. For his part, Kissinger, quote, does not remember that the instructions were as precise as Helms says they were, end quote. His poor memory is natural. But he stated, quote, What mainly came out of the September 15 meeting was that Helms was encouraged to do everything in his power to prevent Allende from taking power. It is clear that President Nixon wanted Helms to encourage the Chilean army to act in collaboration with us or to take the initiative itself in preventing Allende from coming to power, end quote. The other CIA agents and officials who participated in organizing the coup d'etat in Chile emphasized the extreme pressure to which they were subjected by the U.S. government to carry out their mission. Thomas Caramacines, head of the Secret Services of the CIA, maintained, quote, Kissinger left me in no doubt about the fact that he was under maximum pressure for this mission to succeed, and that he in turn was putting maximum pressure on us to achieve this, end quote. The assistant head of the Western Hemisphere section of the CIA stated, quote, This pressure was the most crushing of any that I have witnessed during that time that I had been working. It went to the limits of the bearable, end quote. The supreme head of the section, William Bro, maintained, quote, I have never gone through so hard a period as when we were dealing with the Chilean business. I must say that it was absolutely constant. The pressure didn't stop for a single moment. It came from the White House, end quote. 
Why did the White House, from the beginning until the fall of Allende, have this firm determination to overthrow him? Why this pressure and urgency that were surprising and unexpected even to CIA agents? Some of the most obvious reasons, and of course, ones that he wanted to express, were contained in an informal interview of Kissinger by several journalists on September 16, 1970. Because it was forbidden to transcribe this interview, the various versions differ a little, but they do not differ in the ideas which all the journalists picked out, except that some journalists omitted some statements that others recorded. Reconstructing the interview from the different versions, Kissinger's views were the following. It is now easy to see that if Allende takes power in Chile, there is a strong possibility that, within a few years, he will establish a sort of communist government. In this case, we will have a communist government, and not on a coastal island, lacking traditional relations with and impact on Latin America, but in one of the big countries on the continent. This communist government could unite, for example, with Argentina, with which it shares a long border, or with Peru, which has gone in a direction that makes our relations with it difficult, or with Bolivia, which, even before these events, had gone in a more leftist and anti-American direction. Thus, continued Kissinger, I think we would be fooling ourselves to believe that if Allende takes power, he won't present enormous problems for us, for the democratic and pro-American forces in Latin America, and undoubtedly in the whole Western Hemisphere. What would happen to the Western Hemisphere Defense Committee, to the Organization of American States, is very problematical. Political developments in Chile are very serious for U.S. interests because of their effects in France and Italy. We are following the events very closely. This is one of those situations that aren't exactly happy for American interests. Right at this moment, Latin America has a great deal of influence. There is a complementary point of view in the Senate report on CIA activity in Chile. This view links the problem posed by Allende's victory in Chile to the world struggle between the U.S. and the USSR, something Kissinger did not do, but which is implicit in his reasoning. The report states, quote, Another rationale for U.S. involvement in the internal affairs of Chile was offered by a high-ranking official who testified before the committee. He spoke of Chile's position in a worldwide strategic chess game in 1970. In this analogy, Portugal might be a bishop. Chile, a couple of pawns, perhaps more. In the worldwide strategic chess game, once a position was lost, a series of consequences followed. U.S. enemies would proceed to exploit that new opportunity, and our ability to cope with the challenge would be limited by any American loss." End quote. It seems, therefore, that the U.S. government proposed to overthrow the Allende government, first of all, in order to ensure the balance of power in its conflict with Soviet social imperialism, rather than to defend the interests of one expropriated monopoly or another. But this was obviously not due to the importance of Chile in its own right, since the intelligence reports judged that the U.S., quote, had no vital interest in Chile, the world military balance of power would not be significantly altered by an Allende regime, and an Allende victory in Chile would not pose any likely threat to the peace of the region, end quote. The problem was that, quote, chain reactions are bound to occur in other countries, end quote, for, quote, an Allende victory would represent a psychological setback for the U.S. as well as a definite advance for the Marxist idea, end quote. Where did this Marxist idea that opened the way for Allende victory come from? Everyone knows, from the 20th Congress of the CPSU. Furthermore, this conclusion is explicit in the Kissinger interview in which he speaks of the dangers for the whole Western Hemisphere. However, these conclusions are only a part of the truth. They can explain the quick decision of the U.S. government to attack the Chilean economy from inside and from outside and to encourage a military coup after the election of Allende. However, if the U.S. government feared the maintenance of a Soviet model of socialism, even though it would be developed by the peaceful road, this did not justify its persisting through to the end by means of the most extreme pressure with a strategy aimed at overthrowing Allende for a coup d'etat. On the one hand, it was obvious that, having achieved its goal, the U.S. would be discredited by this new example of brutal interference in another country, which is what in fact happened. In addition, and more importantly, Chile from 1972 on was no longer a model for anyone, even for the Chileans. 
How could a country that had reached more than 1% inflation per day, with an enormous trading deficit, with uncontrolled issue of currency, with state enterprises working at a loss, with a financial deficit estimated in 1973 at more than 40% of its total spending, etc., be a model? Even within the popular unity, it was admitted that the next presidential election was lost. This was the main argument that the CP and other parties used to refuse to call a referendum. It must be asked, then, why the U.S. did not change strategy when Chile was breaking all its own records and many indices that showed the seriousness of the crisis. Why did they not profit by the negative model that Chile offered in order to cause a chain reaction opposite to the one it feared, showing the failure of the socialist model and the peaceful road? Why did they not wait for the certain defeat of this model in the elections of 1976? It may be argued that they feared that UP leadership in the government would officially turn to violent methods to remain in power. Or that the UP would gain influence in the armed forces, thus helping it stay in power. However, all the concrete facts militate against this idea, at least insofar as official means are concerned. The CIA and the Pentagon know better than anyone else that the government did not have support in the army, because they had worked there actively. Moreover, facts showed it. The intelligence reports emphasized the constitutionalist inclinations of Allende and the most important leaders of the UP. As far as the CP leaders were concerned, even Frey assured that they would prevent the government from straying from the path of legality. The vice president of ITT relates the conversation he had over lunch with Frey on December 10, 1971, as follows. Quote, Concerning the future of the Allende government, whether it would remain on the present course or be pulled by the left-wing extremists to a policy of violence and dictatorship, Eduardo Frey did not want to predict. He did comment that the only strongly disciplined political force in the country was the Communist Party, and while the opposition parties were now tending to unify, they could not be compared as a disciplined group with the communists. Furthermore, that Allende would be unlikely to abandon such a hard group, end quote. For the rest, the reports of the CIA itself spoke of, quote, the Orthodox Communist Party in Chile, which opposed violence-prone groups, end quote. Even the little children in Chile knew this. Therefore, it is clear that the U.S. was not afraid that the Allende government would try to solve its problems and stay in power by force. How could they have feared such a thing, in reality, given the hegemony within the UP of communists who, in the midst of the most unbridled reactionary violence, formulated only pious calls for peace and gave as their main slogan, no to civil war? All these considerations force us to ask the question again. Why did the U.S. government implacably keep up the pressure for a coup d'etat right until the end? By studying the events in Chile, one can reach the conclusion that the U.S. government maintained its plan to organize a coup d'etat at all costs on the one hand, to head off the powerful development of the class struggle and the trend, at the end of the agenda government, toward the organization of a political formation opposed to the dominant reformism. And, on the other hand, to avoid the risk of a sort of preview of the Italian historic compromise, an alliance between the UP and the CDP. However, in the longer term, the first factor was particularly important, since the formation of a UP-CDP governing coalition would quickly have radicalized against it those political sectors of the UP which already had a critical attitude towards its opportunist conduct. These sectors, linked to an increasingly militant mass movement, could have opened the way to an increasingly influential revolutionary trend. Although the fear of a UP-CDP alliance was jealously hidden, it is possible to draw this conclusion from the ideas contained in the U.S. Senate report and in the statements of members of the U.S. government. It follows, for example, from Kissinger's allusions to the dangers of the UP experiment in Chile for the Western Hemisphere, and in particular for Italy and France. Kissinger's threats against the Italian Christian Democrats, agreeing to form a coalition government with the Italian Communists, are well known. So is the decision taken by the governments of France, West Germany, and the United States, made public in a Time magazine interview with Helmut Schmidt on July 16, 1976, 
to cut off all economic aid to Italy if such a thing ever occurred. The same conclusion can be drawn from the intelligence report quoted above, which the U.S. government had before their eyes in June 1972, at the time of one of the most important attempts to reach an agreement between the Agenda government and the CDP. The report stated, quote, the most likely course of events in Chile for the next year or so would be moves by Allende towards slowing the pace of his revolution in order to accommodate the opposition and to preserve the gains he had already made, end quote. We have already pointed out that this report was followed by substantial CIA assistance in organizing and assisting the October 1972 strike, and that they succeeded in causing the CDP government talks to be broken off. After that, the CP leadership tried desperately, even brushing up against its allies, to truncate the UP program in order to facilitate the CDP-UP pact. In the opinions expressed in the last NIE sent before the coup d'etat, the central preoccupation with the pact with the CDP, the only chance of survival the UP had left, once again appears. The NIE notes with relief, quote, that the growing polarization of the Chilean society was wearing away the Chilean predilection for political compromise, end quote. One of the essential tasks of the CIA was to encourage this polarization. Despite this remark, and perhaps fearing that the, quote, Chilean predilection for political compromise, end quote, would win out anyway, they continued to believe that the solution lay in the armed forces driving out Allende by force. It should be pointed out that the U.S. government feared a compromise, because it did not have complete confidence in Frey. They feared that his unbridled ambition, of which they were more aware than anyone, and which they had generously fed, could push him into accepting a compromise despite all their warnings. Before Allende even took on his mandate, Frey had hesitated to openly foment a coup d'etat to stop him from doing so, because he hypocritically wanted to maintain his constitutionalist and democratic image. The ITT report, exposed in the U.S. Senate inquiry into the participation of that multinational firm in the attempts to overthrow Allende, states, quote, President Eduardo Frey wants to stop Allende and has said so to intimates. But he wants to do it constitutionally, i.e., either through a congressional vote upset or an internal crisis requiring military intervention. All previous evaluations of Frey's weaknesses in a crisis are being confirmed. Worse, it has been established beyond any doubt that he is double-dealing to preserve his own stature and image as the leader of Latin American democracy. For instance, he told some of his ministers he'd be more than willing to be removed by the military. This would absolve him from any involvement in a coup that, in turn, would upset Allende. Then, he turned right around and told the military chiefs he is totally against a coup, end quote. On September 21, the U.S. ambassador to Chile, Edward Carey, thought it proper to send a message to Frey through the defense minister himself. In this message, he tells Frey that if Allende takes over the presidency, Frey, quote, should know that we won't let a screw or a nut into Chile under Allende. As long as Allende is in power, we will do everything in our power to condemn Chile and Chileans to the greatest deprivation and poverty, as a long-term policy to reinforce the harsh features of a communist society in Chile. Consequently, if Frey expects something other than total poverty, then seeing Chile totally cast down, he is operating under an illusion, end quote. Without any doubt, this warning was not intended to explain to Frey the obstacles that Allende would meet from the U.S., which could only have made Frey rejoice for his future, but to take away any hope that the U.S. would be more tolerant toward the Chilean government if the CDP supported it. To the honor of Frey's faithfulness to the U.S. government, it must be said that he made every possible effort, even if he did so behind the scenes, so as not to compromise his political image, to assist the coup d'etat attempts aimed at preventing Allende's nomination from being ratified by the Congress, including the one that culminated in the assassination of the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. Following his instructions, his minister of the economy publicly painted the picture of a deep economic crisis caused by the defiance aroused by Allende's victory amongst employers. This to stir up the military. That is, he divulged the initial effects of the campaign to sabotage the economy, a campaign inspired by the multinational corporations 
and by the most reactionary interests in the country to bring about a coup d'etat. But Frey did not want to sacrifice the image that would give him the best chance of replacing the overthrown government. At a time when the U.S. government was demanding everything of him in order to calm its worries, he did not want to accept the tarnishing of his pristine image of legalism, and preferred to act only in back rooms. He would never be completely forgiven this, either by the fascist military or by the U.S. government, which knows how to expose itself when its vital interests are at stake. If to this entire portrait of the hesitations of its right-hand man is added the fact, serious for the U.S. government, that Frey was not even able to convince his party to refuse to ratify Allende's nomination as president in the Congress, it is perfectly natural to suppose that they were seriously afraid that CP leaders, and through them the Soviets, would succeed in leading the CDP into a compromise with the government coalition. Hence, their only certain reserve was the army and they decided without hesitation to continue to work for the coup d'etat right through to the end. Today, Frey and his team in the CDP are desperately trying to regain the confidence of the U.S. government and the armed forces to return to power, publicly guaranteeing that they will not be led into a compromise that would allow the CP to return to power, or at least to legal activity in Chile, through an alliance with them. Patricio Ailuin, president of the CDP and Frey's right-hand man, told the Spanish magazine Cambio 16 on June 21, 1976, that to rebuild a democratic government in Chile, quote, one must count on the support of the Christian Democrats, the old radicals, the social democrats, and the liberal right, end quote. And then he utters a threat by maintaining that, quote, if Chile has no democratic way out in the short term, we are heading toward communism, for the junta is a regime that creates polarization, end quote. He clearly says that, quote, democracy cannot coexist with non-democrats. When the communists come in, democracy goes out, end quote. And he adds, quote, in my country, it is unthinkable not to be aware of the armed forces phenomenon. If they are admitted as a political factor, one must count on their participation, and we know that they exclude the communists. This is why to be an ally of the communists is equivalent to renouncing democracy. Democracy.